well, anybody else who shows up, we'll just admit them as they come. Um, so yeah, thanks everybody for coming. This, so our speaker today is uh, Pedro Petsi, and he's a, a student with Loreda uh, Brandao de Freitas at the uh, University of Rio, Federal, the Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul. So he did his uh, undergraduate work there and then transitioned to work on his PhD with Loreta and studying um, petunia and hybridization in petunia. And he's also, uh, I understand, interested in some of the other, uh, so the other related, closely related genera like Calibracoa and Fabiana as well and what's going on with those. So I won't uh, take up any more of your time, Pedro, and you can go ahead and get started. Thank you, Luke. Thank you, everyone, for being here. And I also would like to thank all the organizers of Cell Seminars. Uh, so today we'll be talking about a little bit of my PhD results. So it's a very broad and generic name of hybridization in petunias. Um, but before I talk about petunias, I will talk a little bit about hybridization. So hybridization is, is a very well study phenomena and there are several outcomes of when two species come in contact but um here i really like this figure because it's very simple but it shows very uh, several of these outcomes but here instead of fishes we can think of petunias instead because we can see the similar patterns um today we'll talk a little bit more of forming a hybridization zone where we can when two species they come in contact but we we still can see the difference between these two species but we have a, um, a hybrid zone where we can see a gradient of this genetic component like like here and also uh species can uh after they hybridize they can back cross to the parental species and they can integrate genes into one species into another so this these two uh outcomes are one of the most studied uh, phenomena of uh, hybridization, the outcomes of hybridization. Um, but what do we know about hybridization in petunia? So I think most of you know the petunia hybrida. It is a hybrid between two uh, species of petunia, and they are actually very distinct petunias. One is from the short corolla tube clade, and one is from the long corolla tube clade. But of course, all this diversity here, we can see it's human made and it's not natural. But um, my advisor, Loretta, she has been studying hybridization in Pintunia for a long time. I think the first uh, study that was published that studied the hybridization in Petunia was between um, the hybridization between Petunia exerta and Petunia axillaris, um, and it was in 2006. But since 2006, other uh, hybridization events have been described or suggested. Um, and here I'm going to talk a little bit about one of uh, three of those hybridization events that we think uh, that might be happening in the genus. So in my first chapter, I'm going to talk about two petunia species from the short corolla tube. And then I'm gonna talk a little bit, two subspecies of Petunia axillaris that it's um, the white species pollinated by moths. And then in the third chapter, I'm gonna show some preliminary results that we have about a very interesting population that has a very distinct morphology. Um, so for my first chapter, well, oh, before I, I start on my first chapter, I just wanna give you a very brief overview of Petunia. So, um uh, the phylogeny here we can see there are two main clades so the first clade is a short tube the short corolla tube clade where we can find all species that are purple and they are bee pollinated and they have a very short corolla tube when we compare to the long corolla tube clade uh and this uh, long corolla tube clade it, it's interesting because we can see here species there uh, have a more diversity of uh, corolla colors and also pollinators. So here we have Petunia axillaris that has three subspecies and they are pollinated by moths and they are white. Uh, we also have Petunia secreta that is a 
uh, purple species pollinated by bees and Petunia exerta that is a red species pollinated by uh, hummingbirds. So for my first chapter, I will be talking about these two species here that belong to the short corolla tube clade, Petunia interior and Petunia inflata. Uh, this phylogeny shows them as sister species, but there are some uh, newer works from Luke that, uh, that show that they might not be that related. So we don't know much about it yet, but we thought they were sister species. And we decided to uh, look a little more into those species because so we thought they were sister species. They also have a very similar morphology. They, it's very hard to distinguish them. Um, also, they have an overlapping distribution. I'm going to show you on the map in a few in the next slides. And several works show that they share several types of genetic markers. So in this chapter, we decided to take a look into them and um, try to identify a little bit of these species boundaries. Like, are they really two different species or they are the same species with some uh, morphology differences uh, depending on the population. Also, we try to search for some hybridization and understand a little bit of their evolutionary history. So this is how this is what they look like. So this is between interior, this is between inflator. They are very, very similar. And I would say most like all the species from the short Corolla tube, they are very, very similar to this, uh, this um, figures we can see here. So just I just want to uh, give a, a shout out for Professor Aureliano Bombarelli and Dr. Uh, Giovanna Giudicelli. So Giovanna was a, a student in my lab and she was a visiting student in Professor Aureliano Bombarelli's lab um, when he was in Virginia Tech. And that's how we got the data for this chapter and all the other chapters that I'm going to show you uh, today. So, uh, um, so it's a collaboration with him and I just wanted to say thank you for them. Uh, so we use genotyping by sequencing for all these populations here. So here in the shaded blue area, we have the, um, we can see the distribution of between interior on the, orange shaded area is the distribution of Petunia inflata, and they occur here in southern Brazil, part of Argentina, and Paraguay, baby. And they have a large overlap area here in the transitional zone between the Atlantic forest and the grasslands. So we focused our sampling here in this area. Um, and yeah, so what we saw when we uh, look at the, the structure of these populations, we see that these populations, that, uh, these species, they have different genetic components. And we can see little sharing of some of the blue genetic components here in the admixture, but it's not that much. And fast structure showed that K equals three and revealed that two populations of between inflata would be uh, would have their own genetic component. And also one thing that I would like to highlight here is that Terry one, this population Terry one, that it's here in the, in here we collected as between interior, it was deposited in the herbarium for many, many years as between interior. But this analysis and the all other analysis show that it was actually a between inflata. So it's just to show you how hard it is to distinguish these two species, even for very qualified taxonomists. But yeah, so they are very, very similar. But after this, we consider this population as a petunia fleta and not as petunia interior. Um, we also did some niche modeling, trying to see where the overlap was. And so here in, in orange, we can see the suitability for Petunia inflata, and here in, in blue, the suitability for Petunia interior. 
And here on C, it's just an overlap of these two images. So we can see they have a re really huge overlap here. And this area here uh, corresponds to this transitional zone between the two biomes. And also we um, try to, to see if they had some niche differences or not. So we use the Shanners D and the I statistic as a measurement of niche overlap. And we uh, compare it to the new hypothesis. So we can see here that they have a little bit of uh, near niche similarities. But when we compare to the uh, to identity test, the new hypothesis, we can see that it's significant showing that they have distinct niche preferences. So they have um, they are, they didn't conserve the same niche. Um, so. Before I, I go to, to that part, it's interesting to see here that this area of Atlantic forest and the grasslands, so they have different biomes, so they have different environmental conditions, and they, there's also um, an elevation difference here. So the Atlantic forest is uh, more, this region here on the north part has more elevation here than the, the grassland area. So we used elevation, environment, environmental conditions, and geographical distance, trying to uh, to see if they could explain the genetic differentiation of species of the, these populations. And what we saw in the GLMM analysis is that a combination of geography, environment, and elevation they best explain the genetic differentiation of these populations. Um, to search for hybrids, we did the, the famous Ebababa test for those who are not very familiar with the test. So here we can um, make a, a, a tree. So this is the relationship of, of the phylogenetic relationship of the, the populations and species. And then we call the test calculate the number of uh, SNPs that are shared between this population one from species one and the population from species two that are not concordant with the phylogeny. So it would be the BEBA uh, pattern. And then it calculates the same thing, but for population two from species one and the population from species two. So that will be the EBA pattern. And if only incomplete lineage sorting was happening here, we would expect the BEBA and EBA patterns to be very similar. But when we see a difference uh, in these patterns here, we can, uh, it suggests there, are, there is hybridization between the, the taxa that have the share the most of the pattern. So we did several combinations of uh, populations trying to see what the value was, and we can see that several, several populations, they show sign of hybridization. So we can see that it's, um, uh, <clears throat> hybridization is widespread here in, in this system. But the thing is, Abba Baba, it doesn't tell you the direction of the hybrid, the, the direction of gene flow. So trying to understand a little bit of this direction of gene flow and a little bit of the, evolutionary history of this species. We used fessing coal and we created four different models um, to understand this, this pattern. So we investigated a model with a strict isolation, one model with continuous migration, one model for uh, gene flow during the early times of speciation and one with allopatric speciation and secondary contact and gene flow during secondary contact. And this is what we found. So the data suggests and uh, corroborates the allopatric speciation model and gene flow after secondary contact. And that would be a bidirectional and symmetrical gene flow between species. So just to summarize what we saw in this chapter, we, we can see that these species are indeed two different species. They have different genetic components. They have different uh, niche preferences, even though they have a overlap between uh, 
the, the in this transitional zone but we can also see signs of hybridization and gene flow uh, between these species. Um, so for chapter two, we uh, investigated two subspecies of Petunia axillaris, that is a white Petunia and has a very much larger range than these other species that I talked in the chap on chapter one. They are both white and they are moth pollinated. So one subspecies is Petunia axillaris axillaris, and the other one is Petunia axillaris parodi. I'm, I'm just gonna call Petunia axillaris for this one here and Petunia parodi for the other one. And even though they are subspecies, they are not that uh, related. So we can imagine them as different species here. Um, so here we can see that the distribution range is very different from the, the species on chapter one. They have very wide um, distribution. So here in red, the shaded area in red is the distribution for Petunia parodi. And here in blue is the distribution range for Petunia axillaris. And what's interesting about these two subspecies is that we can find here in this region, uh, in the middle of Uruguay, across the, along the Negro River, we can see some individuals with a very different morphology. And it occurs here in this region here that we called as context on one, but also here in the, the origin of the Negro River in the Bajé region in, in Southern Brazil where we can find also some individuals with a different morphology and this we called context zone two so we collected individuals from these both context zones as well as canonical individuals and we use genotyping by by sequencing data again and we also collected some measurements of the flowers trying to see if there's a difference in flower morphology of these species in how it uh correspond like how how it it is on the context zones so um here in the structure analysis we focused on k equals two because we are interested in hybridization and here we can see that petunia parati that is this red one here um has all most of the individuals from this region, they fall within here in the Petunia, Petunia parodi uh, cluster, but we can also see some individuals from context zone one here in the north part of the Negro River in Uruguay. And in Petunia axillaris, you can see a very similar pattern of, uh, uh, sorry, uh, individuals here in this, this region. And, but most of the individuals here from the context zone two uh, they fall within the Petunia axillaris cluster here, but this is a very nice figure because it shows the gradient that we expect to see on hybrid zones, as I showed you on the picture, the figure on the introduction slides with the fishes. So we see a, a beautiful gradient between Petunia parati and Petunia axillaris. And what's interesting here is that these individuals, they are all individuals from this population here in the south part, on the south, on, right on the south of the Negro River, but we can also find some individuals that would be considered as canonical of one of the, the species. Uh, so for both of them, they can be, we can find some signs of genetic, genetic component sharing in this uh, subspecies, in these other regions that we wouldn't consider as contact zones. Um, the DAPC with uh, morphological data also supports this hybridization. So we can see here in red the morphology uh, of Petunia parati, and here in, in, in blue for Petunia axillaris. I think it's hard to see this gray here, but this gray corresponds to the individuals from context zone, that is individuals that are located in the origin of the Negro River. So they fall more, more within the Petunia axillary cluster, but we can see some individuals with a intermediate morphology between the two subspecies. And here on context on one, we can see individuals that 
fall within Petunia parati, some individuals that fall within Petunia axillaris, and some individuals that are very intermediate between the two species. Um, so we also uh, used fasting coal trying to see the demographic history of these two species. And it's a very similar analysis and we tested the same models that we tested on chapter one. But what's interesting here is that we can see that the hybridization uh, occurred mo much more recently than it occurred on chapter one. So on chapter one it was five, to 6,000 years ago, and this is 300 years ago. And it shows that the hybridization here in this, for this uh, species is much more recent. Um, we also did some Abababa tests. Uh, and here we can see uh, that this population here, population one, that is the one right south of the Negro River show the highest uh, hybridization levels. Uh, this population here is population two is the one right north of the Negro River. So it has a, a positive D value. So that would suggest that the other populations have more hybridization sign than this one. And uh, I'll talk a little bit more about this on the next slide. All the populations here from context zone two, they they have significant values of the uh, of hybridization, but it's not as strong as in population one. So we can see here that this population is much more hybrid than these populations here on the north. And the other populations from the north of the Negro River, they showed no or very low signs of hybridization. Um, and then we try to classify the individuals that we had uh, on six categories. So uh, for this, we use new hybrid. That's not, it, this analysis doesn't handle the much of um, SNPs that we had. So we chose the 300 SNPs that had the highest FST between Petunia axillaris and Petunia parati. And then we classify this uh, all the individuals in these six categories. But what's interesting to see is that we can find back crosses within Petunia axillaris and also within Petunia parati. Context zone two, that is the one here in the north part of the Negro River, only had pure individuals of Petunia axillaris or back crosses to Petunia axillaris. But here, the context zone one, that is the one right in the middle of Uruguay, um, it contains all the categories. So here, the, the four populations more to the north, they are considered as pure Petunia parati or back crosses to Petunia parati. Um, this other population here, that's the one, this one here right on the, the, the first one north of the Negro River, it only showed pure individuals of Petunia axillaris. So we kind of justify the the high, the positive value here, suggesting that the other populations, ooh, sorry, these other populations are more hybrid than this one. So it, it makes sense. And here, all these individuals here, they belong to population one, that is the one right on south of the Negro River. And here we can find almost every category of hybrids. So we have pure, axillaris, and all the other categories of hybrids. We just don't find pure, between a parody. But what's interesting to see in this chapter is that, so um, we have this very, very hybrid zone here and this region is what is actually connecting these two species in introgressing genes into uh, introgressing genetic material in into this uh, other, uh, which would be the canonical populations. So this is a very recent hybrid zone where we can find F1 hybrids. And it suggests that this context on two here is more, um, it also has some signs of hybridization, but it's not as strong uh, as this one here. So it suggests that that could be um, a little bit older context zone and hybrid zone between these two species. Um, and for chapter three, um, I'm just going to show you some preliminary results that we have of a very interesting population. So 
this population here occurs in the, the side of a highway and it contains a very uh, wide diversity of colors. So we can see some individuals that are much more pigmented like this one and some individuals that are more uh, light purple. And this is not a color that we would find in natural populations from the, at least for the species that we know. And what's interesting about this population is that it occurs in a region where we can we, we have a very high diversity of petunia species. So in this region, we can find petunia integrifolia, that is a purple species that belongs to the short corolla tube clade. We can find petunia secreta, that it's a long tube uh, flower with purple flowers. We have petunia axillaris, that is a white one. Uh, and also Petunia exerta, that is a red one uh, pollinated by hummingbirds. And we also included here in, in, in our sampling uh, individuals of Petunia parodi, that is also a white one and could be parental species of this putative hybrid. And also some uh, distinct population of Petunia secreta. Um, I'm just going to show you pictures here, why it's different. So this is what we know about Petunia secreta. It occur, we don't have much, uh, many populations of this uh, species, but it occurs in a very specific region in Brazil and in some uh, rock towers. And we have very few individuals per population. The plants are not that tall. And then we have this other population that occurs close to it, but not in the, the the place that we would expect. And it has much, much um, number of individuals much higher than, than we would expect. So here we can find more than 500 individuals in this uh, population here. And the individuals are much, much taller than the canonical Petunia secreta. And these are the individuals that we find in this putative hybrid. So the color is very different, although we have some purplish flowers. So that's why we included all of these uh, Petunia secreta lineages. So these are very preliminary results. So feedback on these results will be very welcome. Uh, but here is a, a PCA, we can see that Petunia integrifolia and Petunia parodi, they don't close all together with the other individuals. Uh, and if you see a phylogeny, we, we would expect this result. And here in this cluster, we can see that uh, Petunia axillaris, these putative hybrids, Petunia secreta, they are very well, very clustered together here. And then when we see a structure analysis, we can see the same result that Petunia exerta and Petunia integrifolia and Petunia parodi, they they have their own genetic components. And then we can see the clustering of Petunia axillaris and Petunia secreta as uh, the, same, uh, the same group. And then we can see that this putative hybrids and the individuals of Petunia secreta that have a very distinct morphology, they had they have their own genetic components. Although we can see some sharing of uh, genetic components with several uh, other species. So here, the putative hybrids, they have components of Petunia axillaris and Petunia secreta, also some uh, components of Petunia secreta from the new lineage, and also the green component that belongs to Petunia parodi, and also Petunia exerta. So it's, it's a mix of everything here. Uh, and then we did the SVD quartets to see the, uh, understand a little bit of the phylogeny of these uh, populations. And we can see that the, the putative hybrids and these individuals from uh, the population of Petunia secreta, they, they are within the Petunia secreta cluster. And what we know when it's hybrid, maybe a phylogeny is not the best way to represent it. So this is a, this is a very, preliminary result of the SNAC, so where we can, we are trying to investigate the uh, uh, network of these uh, populations, and it suggests there is a, a migration from Petunia parodi to these uh, individuals here in, in these putative hybrids uh, of 
Petunia Secreta and maybe Petunia Parati. We don't know that for sure. So as a take home message of my presentation here, I um, just wanted to show you how hybridization is common within the Petunia genus. And what's interesting about this genus is that we can find hybridization at different time scales. So we have really recent hybrids and some evidence of ancient hybridization. And so that's a very cool system to study. And it leaves us with a question of if this is introgression in Petunia is adaptive and what is actually the role and how it uh, impacted the evolution of the Petunia genus and how it has um, maybe made Petunia to adapt to new environments or new things like that. So we have very interesting questions that we could ask uh, about the role of hybridization in this system. And so I would like to thank you all for watching my presentation, my advisor, uh, all the people that made this work possible. So a special thanks to Aureliano, Carol Turqueto, Giovanna, uh, Sebastian, um, all the organizers for the SOL seminars and all the funding agencies in Brazil. So I'm very happy to take any questions. Awesome. Thanks, Pedro. That was a, that was really interesting. Um, yeah, I like the the thing about the different uh, time scales when you're seeing. Yeah. Um, yeah. So if anybody has a question, you can feel free to either you know type your question in the chat and I can read it, or uh, just put in the chat that you have a question and feel free to turn on your mic and ask ask away. see what have we got got a very nice presentation from thank you said. um yeah so uh let's see oh i'm starting i'm starting to get some things uh okay uh gustavo you have a question yes hello uh, can you hear me? Yes. 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 Hi. Nice. Uh, so yeah, uh, first of all, congratulations for the nice results. Thank you. As a former student from uh, Loretta's lab, it's very nice to see that all the development of this uh, work that are you doing. So it's it's really nice. It's very interesting. I'm just curiosity about this population of the Petunia interior, the 31. That is, you mentioned that is so similar to the inflata, uh, at least in the review in, in the some uh, taxonomic uh, classifications. You mentioned this one here. Yeah, uh -huh. that's it is actually from the inflata uh, cluster. Yeah, that's a. It was collected as a petunia interior, but it's actually a petunia inflata. Yeah. Uh, I'm just wondering if uh, this uh, like difference of the morphology uh, that makes this confusion in the in the taxonomy it's due to uh, uh, like hybridization or integration or do you think that it could be more like a, a plastic uh, expression or phenotype due to that it's actually uh, in the in a more similar um, I don't know, ecologically or environmental similar to the inflata. So what's, what's your opinion about that? Uh, I would say that's more plastic and it's very, I don't think that's because of the hybridization that these populations are, it's just because they are very recent. They speciated very recently. So their morphology is very, very similar. And it doesn't occur only for these two species. I think all the species from the short Corolla to play, they have very similar morphologies. Uh, so yeah, we have to pick, like they have more uh, morphological differences, of course, but sometimes it's not as clear as we wanted it to be. But yeah, but I think it's more because of plants are plants, they, they can change, they are plastic, yeah. Cool, yeah, thank you. Thank you.
All right. Uh, looks like we have also a question from uh, Pat. If you want to go ahead. Sure. Um, I really love this system uh, and uh, very nice talk. I, I was Thank wondering you. if you do, do you do crosses? And if you do crosses between these species, do you see any kind of um, consequence in terms of um, direction of the cross or um, any kind of reproductive uh, consequences to to doing making hybrids in the in your uh, greenhouse or your, your okay uh, I never did crosses at, not with the species that I'm working with but there's my colleague Alexia and she works with crosses and she's making many many crosses of the long tube uh, petunias in the greenhouse and Yes, you can see difference of uh, some, uh, I think when the excerta, but it's more like to do with the red petunia, the white petunia and the purple petunia, they live in a very close region. So she's doing the crosses with all of those species. And I think you can see that when petunia excerta is the mother, it has more success. So there are some differences. Yeah, but I don't have the numbers here and yeah. That it's more Alexia's work, yeah, but we can see differences in that, yeah. Yeah, but we, we don't see. have data for this species here for the short, um, the short Corolla tube clay. We don't have much crosses in greenhouse, so yeah. We we have a recorded presentation from Alexia from earlier this year on the Solon AC seminar YouTube channel. I don't remember if she talked about that specific question or not, but. Anyway, if you want to check it out. Okay, I would definitely will. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, let's see. There was a question from Janet Sullivan about pollinators. Yes, thank you. Um, I was wondering, and it sounds like this was not part of your research, but I um, was under the impression that those short tube and long tube species would not cross because they had different pollinator um, syndromes and you know long tube say moths and then shorter tube uh, bees that could actually get down into the reproductive parts in the in the more open corollas and I was wondering if you knew anything about the pollinators that are visiting these plants in what seems like a disturbed um, interface between um, different habitats. Yeah, we don't have much data about the pollinators and who is visiting who and who is making the cross of uh, with this, uh, because all of these species, they are bee pollinated. So we could expect that the hybridization here oh. would be much more frequent than these here, because here we have a very wide variation of pollinators, but we can see hybrids within moth pollinated and hummingbird pollinated species. So someone is doing that, but we don't have much like who is who is making the cross, we don't know who is responsible for, for okay. the hybrids. Okay, and then I wonder if you're getting these hybrids occurring naturally, and I guess this is a separate question. So maybe I'm jumping in where I shouldn't be, but um, if you're if these hybrids are occurring naturally in these this disturbed interface between the uh, more um, pristine environment of the of the two parent species, um, is that happening? I, and I guess this has to do with what's the mother species and or what's the mother yeah and the pollen parent and the and the ovulate parent. Um, are you seeing different like micro populations? Are you seeing something that could be def um, named as a hybrid species? Is it is it more uniform in nature, I guess, was my question. <laughs> so just so to know that I understood your question correctly, you <laughs> want to know about the region where these hybrids are happening? Yeah, I guess it wasn't a very, well-formulated question. I was just thinking about some things where there are multiple hybridization events, but but then we see sort of a uniform morphology and a uniform 
geography. And so we're more comfortable um, defining that as a hybrid species, uh, uh, notho species. Um, and I'm wondering if you're seeing that, or are you seeing different um, little micro populations that might not be so uniform? Mm, I don't know much about that, but uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, maybe, we, I don't know. I don't know if anybody has like a, an idea of it, but um, I don't know. I don't know. Well, it's interesting. I was thinking about like uh, what I see in Fisilis in Florida, where there's so much disturbance. And I think hybridization has occurred multiple times and you get these little um, or not so little populations that have a really distinct morphology. Um, and so I'm wondering if something like that is occurring here in, with, um, with Petunia in this interface. It would require a lot of field work, I guess, and yeah. it's a different different question than what you were asking. <laughs> yeah, we have so many questions that we can ask within the system. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Makes it fun and interesting. Great presentation. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Well, well explained and and um, and great illustrations. Thank you. All right. Um... I'm not seeing any more questions in the chat, I don't think, unless I missed something, let me know. But uh, I guess if nobody else has any more questions, we can, can call it. Uh... Oh no, I lost my Zoom window, there it is. Um, yeah, so I should probably say for our next seminar, which is not next Friday, but the Friday after that, we have um, a speaker. Uh, let me, it's uh, also another speaker from, from Rio Grande do Sul, I believe. Um, so, uh, let's see, we've got, yeah, so October 28th, that one will be on, um, uh, from Carolyn Turquetto, and she is going to be talking about integrative approaches in Nicotiana. Um, so that'll be our next seminar. Hopefully we'll see you there. Uh, thanks again, Pedro. It was a really cool, Thank you. interesting talk and yeah, good luck with all the research. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Bye everyone. Bye-bye.